Hello and welcome to YHTV's Magical Medical Tour. This is episode 39. Thank you very much for joining us here today. I'm Christina Suzuma, and with me is our wonderful medical guide and my co-host, Dr. Glenn Woolman. Hello, Dr. Woolman. Good day to you. And great day to you, Christina. And greetings, everyone, and welcome to Magical Medical Tour. I am Dr. Glenn Wallman. I will be your medical guide along with Christina today as we each week search through the healthcare galaxy, searching for optimal health. And we're still searching, especially during this uh, holiday season. Oh, very much so. <laughs> Have uh, you seen the drivers out there lately? <laughs> uh, yes. I used to, uh, when I was in the emergency department, I used to work uh, Christmas Eve and Christmas and Thanksgiving. And so I... Did I you choose these holidays? I did. Work? I did. I did for a few reasons. One, I had no children mm -hmm. and I felt that the my coworkers really needed that time with their children. Oh, that's so nice. Yes, and I and I like doing that for them. Mm -hmm. And in return, when I wanted to take a vacation, they were very comfortable giving me the time that I needed, mm -hmm. which was usually on non-holiday times. I tried not to go anywhere else. That was another thing. I didn't want to be away traveling during holidays and dealing with Right. The people driving or traveling in planes and everything like that. And plus, uh, from another point of view, from a academic emergency medicine love of what I do point of view, mm. the greatest things came in over those times. Mm. Uh, the most challenging things, the most interesting things. Uh, turned out that usually Christmas Eve, Christmas Day were uh, the saddest Oh. Of, th of things that we would see in the emergency department based on the stresses that were put upon people. Stresses is what we're going to talk about today because uh, I thought over the Christmas holidays there's lots of stress going on about doing things and seeing people and everything else. And we used to see some pretty uh, disheartening things at that time. We also mm -hmm. saw wonderful things, mm -hmm. clearly. Hmm. But yes. <clears throat> wow, that's quite a time to work, and yeah, uh, yeah, it's uh, it would be sad if if emergencies took place in families at that time, you know, but, right when you're gathering, right? <laughs> but sometimes, you know, if the emergency was not that bad, uh, not life or limb or sight threatening, and it was just a little cut or a bruise or a bump or something like that, and you had the opportunity to take some of the kids that were there being sad. Because they're not home, as you're alluding to, you know, partying uh, and make them laugh and be happy. And, of course, the nurses were always great about things like that. We would get into any time we could see a little kid that would come in or an adult, didn't matter, uh, come in with uh, being a little bit sad at that time. And we had the opportunity to change their attitude and make them happy and enjoy uh, the experience they had in the emergency department. It was almost like giving them a present. You know, mm. they took their worst nightmare and it became a great story for them. And uh, so that was always fun mm -hmm. to uh, try and accomplish as part of working in an emergency department also. Mm. Wonderful. Well, I could see you having a good time. Look what you're wearing on your shirt today. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, it's honoring uh, Edvard Munch, the uh, Norwegian artist, uh, his famous rendition of... Uh, it, sometimes it has the name, the scream, the shout, but it's a person uh, who obviously is in some form stressed <laughs> out. I would say. So that was, uh, I thought it would be an interesting topic to speak about today. Mm. Uh, you know, as a medical guide, I always talk about my six categories of <clears throat> what people need for optimal health to recognize and to uh, work on and be conscious of, not just intellectually understanding it, but to be conscious of. And that's exercise and nutrition and sleep management, uh, spirituality, which we spoke about last uh, a few weeks ago, and then patterns of behavior, which we spoke about in our last episode, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and stress management. And I thought today might be an opportunity to just speak a little bit about stress. 
Uh, we all seem to feel it, and it's part of us, but I don't think that everyone has an understanding of what it might be and what it might mean, and we're learning more about that now. So let me ask you, do you what do you think of as stress? What do I think of as stress? Let, let me, hmm. What is um, stress, the concept of stress? Not, not you know, something else, just as a concept. Hmm. When, when, when things become a little overwhelming or overpowering mm -hmm. uh, in whatever way it might be, whether it be uh, physically or emotionally or mentally, you know, just, just seems a little daunting. That, that's stress to me. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I remember uh, sometime uh, once I was in the emergency department and it was a pretty hectic day. Uh, and you know, I could just name things that might have been in there. I might have had in bed one a baby seizing, in bed two was a elderly uh, grandmother with congestive heart failure, in bed three was a, a gunshot wound to the abdomen, uh, bed four was somebody with a headache, uh, mm. and go on and on and on. And then the uh, the radio goes off and says we're getting six from an accident, two criticals. And then I go in to see someone really quickly before the accident gets there, and it's a 15 or 16 or 16 year old uh, person. Uh, and I say to them, I introduce myself and say, How may I help you? And they go, Dude, I'm stressed out. <laughs> <laughs> and I look around and, and say, Okay, well, I, I mean, I'm looking at what I'm doing. What is it that's stressing you out on that kind of level? Uh, he would say, well, I work at, uh, you know, this burger place and, you know, trying to remember the fries and the Coke and the, and the this and the that. It's just stressing me out. <laughs> so I realized, you know, obviously stress is uh, it's relative. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about that today. Uh, we didn't know what stress was for a long time. And I mean, we had ideas of it, but um uh, there's a Hungarian endocrinologist, uh, someone who studies the endocrine glands like the thyroid, the adrenals, uh, pituitary gland, uh, all the glands in the body. Uh, and he was Hungarian. And in the 1900s, he recognized that people had these symptoms or syndromes to adapt to things that were overwhelming or daunting, as you say. Mm -hmm. And he started recognizing that not only did they have the symptoms and the signs, uh, an increased heart rate or pupils that were dilated, uh, a number of other things, he started looking at it and also started putting connections together <clears throat> to see that, uh, to define stress. He called it a, something like a general adaptation syndrome. But he also was one of the first to start recognizing that uh, too much stress may have consequences for people. And that's part of also what I want to speak about today. So in looking at stress, as you know, always, I never just speak about one topic. I always look at a <laughs> holistic, holistic medicine. <laughs> exactly. it's holistic medicine. I, there is no one topic because it's all complex. And it's all integrated. And in order to really get an understanding, you have to look at sometimes other parts. Uh, and it's interesting. This specific, the way uh, the body deals with stress is amazingly complex and amazingly integrated among systems in the body. But I digress. We always talk about cells, you and I, Christina, where uh, – depending on what we believe in terms of embodiments and spirituality and rainbow bodies and things like that. I believe that in this realm, we are about cells and each cell I always talk about has its function. Liver cells do liver things, heart cells do heart things, uh, nervous system cells do nervous system cell things and cells 
uh, are put together into groups of cells to make tissue, and then tissues make an organ, and then a group of organs make a system. And then all of the systems make an organism. So all of our mm. systems are working together based on cells. And I also, you know, as I go through this today, Christina, normally uh, when I speak, I, I like to have questions at the end. But I think uh, because you always represent the every person, if I start to get too complex or something you don't understand, I think in this particular case, stop me a little bit mm -hmm. and let's clear something up because it's this is a complex story, but I'm going to try and simplify it if I can. You're going to put us through stress, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, so that you understand it, and then I'll teach you how to uh, recognize it, and then I'll teach you what problems will occur because of it, and then hopefully <laughs> teach you ways to get out of it. So that would be the plan. Yeah, it's the stress of you know suddenly hearing, okay, today, kids, uh, close your books. We're having a pop quiz. You know, the, the people that were prepared are not that stressed. The people that weren't prepared, syndrome, the general adaptation syndrome starts. So cells have functions, as, as we spoke about, and <clears throat> they're the general sort of the regulatory system produces uh, things that happen so that an organism can grow, digest food reproduce, have an immune system. These are all regulatory functions that the body needs to have on a moment-to-moment -moment daily basis in order to grow from a child to an adult, to have another child, uh, and keep our species going. So these are all our regulatory systems. And in order for the cells to do this, stress, uh, an understanding of stress for me starts with metabolism which is hard to imagine, but our cells get energy through oxygen and the things that we eat. We eat proteins. Proteins are broken down. We eat fats. Fats are broken down. We eat carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are broken down. Uh, all of the cells need uh, each of these for different functions, but basically they need to have uh, glucose, carbohydrates, for energy so that each function can occur. And while life is good and life is in balance, the energy uh, received from the foods we eat, if it's good food, we get better energy. If it's bad food, we get worse energy. If it's good oxygen, we get good energy and bad oxygen, we don't get it. <laughs> hmm, uh, we do live here in Southern California. Yeah, that's, that's true, but, and it's something to recognize. So, Metabolism goes on. When something happens in the body where a perceived stress or trigger happens, uh, some kind of a danger, uh, a threat or something else, and also threats can be, I mean, stress can be interesting and fun in the sense that uh, getting on a, getting on a uh, roller coaster. Mm. The same reaction happens in the body. The heart rate goes up and things go on and you get excited. So there's an exhilarating part to the stress process, depending on what's, what the trigger is and what's happening. Also, stress can be very helpful sometimes. If you're stressed out about a paper that's due tomorrow, you'll probably be able to stay up late at night and get it done. So there are mm -hmm. some very good aspects to stress, especially the way the body was designed evolutionary-wise um, in terms of having what we call that fight-or-flight system for us. Uh, so if a saber-toothed tiger is coming after us, we can gather our forces and be in the best of condition at that moment to get away from the saber-toothed tiger, flight, or fight with the saber-toothed tiger. And this whole system uh, starts to go on. So what happens is that when the body perceives uh, what's going on, a number of things happen to promote uh, the metabolic process to start getting as much sugar as possible into the cells, but specific cells. When the stress system happens, the regulatory things that we spoke about, growth and reproduction, et cetera, 
immune system and uh, digestion all stop. And the two systems that really go to work are the brain, which includes the senses. Uh, you know, you need to be able to see and focus and hear uh, to escape a danger, or know to go away from the direction of a fire or a car or, or something. And also to uh, send the, the glucose to the muscles so that they can activate and do the right things, which means that the stress syndrome is actually counter-regulatory. Hmm. So it's the re against the regulatory system, it closes down digestion. So you're not having to have a bowel movement at the time that you want to uh, run away from something hmm. uh, or deal with something. It, it increases heart rate. It increases blood pressure. It cuts down. It increases the platelets, the parts that clot, uh, that help clot in the blood. Uh, it turns off salivary glands. It does a number of things. It stops uh, growth and and eventually it hurts the immune system. But uh, <clears throat> so this is counter regulatory and it's a it's kind of an alarm system. And things happen where uh, you get to get away from whatever stress happened, and then through the system. Uh, everything deregulates and things calm down. The heart rate comes back to normal. Uh, and you calm down again and you're breathing more quietly and you're feeling better after you get off the roller coaster or after you were scared by a car almost hitting you or being in the haunted house. Things uh, calm down. And that's the way the system works. It, it's acute and it happens. It gets something efficiently done. If there are uh, if you need more glucose, it has ways of producing hormones that uh, take the protein and the fat in the body where, where glucose is sort of being stored and energy is being stored, and it breaks them down to bring more into the bloodstream to get to the muscles and the brain. Mm. Everything calms down, and then life goes on again. We're actually... Uh, hardwired for that. Our brain can handle that. Our body can handle that. And we're good with it. Now, what, what about those people who, when they come under a lot of stress, you know, sometimes children and, you know, sometimes, you know, people who are a little more elderly, I mean, they have to go pee. Like they have, the, their body tenses up so much that they just have to go to the bathroom. What about that? Part of that is psychological, but part of that has to do with, uh, the the next aspect of what we're talking about when the acute process starts to become more long term hmm. what's happened we didn't know this for a very long time but in the 1990s and i will answer your question i hope <laughs> i make or a sound or something when I actually did answer it within my little rant here. Um, back in the 90s, the medical uh, societies and uh, associations decided, well, they always decide on something new to study, uh, to focus on. And in the 90s, they started putting all of their focus, not all of their focus, but a great deal of new focus and research on the brain and the nervous system. And combined with uh, different types of imaging, uh, you know, MRIs and uh, different types of scans of the brain and different ways of measuring uh, many of the functions of the body, the physiology of the body. I remember when we had our talk with Dr. Dan Fox, the radiologist, and he spoke about his reason for going into medicine. He said, I finally wanted to know how it all works. And so the physiology is what it's all about. And we're starting to learn how stress works and what it does acutely. But we're also starting to learn how it, over time, if we are too stressed and chronically stressed, our bodies can't take it and it breaks down and it breaks down in Almost. Uh, well, I don't even want to say almost. I think every system of the body has the potential to break down over time. And we're seeing more and more evidence of uh, this as we move along with our neuroimaging. 
were able to take somebody, for example, and uh, put them in an MRI and scanner and associate things with them about love or about uh, a sexual emotion uh, or an excitement or a fear. Mm. And we can now see what parts of the brain are lighting up when this part of the brain uh, lights up when fear happens. These connections get made. And, and then we're seeing not only that, but we're also seeing what are the long-term effects. And we're able to look at that, for example, and say, let's take all these Vietnam War veterans who are having post-traumatic stress disorders and, and fear syndromes. And we're looking at certain parts of their brain and we're seeing that they're these parts of their brain are shrinking mm. shrill away. And th this is evidence that stress uh, can do that. And we're seeing so many different areas where stress is helping to, over time, break down uh, parts of the body that are over-functioning because they just can't be at that level. Remember I said that this, this counter-regulatory system is uh, – it it works quickly and then it should stop. But if it keeps going on, it affects things so that they they just can't take it. Just like if you had to keep running all the time, eventually you would just stop and you couldn't run anymore and things wear down. Well, that's mm -hmm. that's what we're seeing is happening chronically with people. And as we learn more about it, we learn the physiology of the stress. So <clears throat> we realize now that it starts out, uh, stress, hap stress is caused by genetics. People have genetic uh, predispositions to have their stress switches turned on or turned off. And it also has to do with environment and experiences. If you're uh, a child experiencing abuse, uh, you're going to have stresses that come into your system and you're going to be more fearful. Parts of your brain and triggers are going to be on high alert all the time. And this high alertness eventually wears us down. So it, it needs to be dealt with. And as these systems break down, uh, the normal function of a person who can hold their uh, urine in their bladder uh, is able to do that. But over time, the bladder getting worn down and the sphincters in the bladder and the nervous uh, connections to the bladder get distorted and therefore, connections happen where when you get excited, the bladder doesn't hold and you have to move. And, uh, and there are so many other examples of that. Did that answer that? Mm. <laughs> so so, so, so did I, did I mi miss the one? Okay, so that would be what would be happening with someone who is older, mm -hmm. right? Or that, that has been worn down. But then what about children? Is it because their muscles and everything is still coming together and still finding its way? Right. And the, connecting? <laughs> not only that, but if if the connections are being made mm -hmm. during stressful times, remember now it's not the regulatory systems that are growing. If, if their connections are me being made more in a time when it's counter-regulatory, then they learn different, uh, oh. and it's, this becomes partly psychosomatic medicine. Psycho is mind, soma is body. Uh, we used to use that as sort of uh, a negative phrase, meaning, oh, it's just all in your mind. You don't really have this, but this is where Selye's work and other, and other work has, has come into play saying, no, it's not just that. This is the original root cause potentially of why something is going on. Mm, I see, because I, I just ran into someone recently that said that um, this child had uh, basically psychosomatic deafness uh, because uh, when they were really young, the parents were uh, fighting terribly and the, the child just switched off, basically. Yeah, why not? You know, yeah. So, so by three, he wasn't able to hear anymore. Um, and of course, we, we know of the, the adults, um, you know, like the Cambodian women who suffer psychosomatic blindness from witnessing all the, the extreme torturing and um, 
events uh, by the Khmer Rouge. So, so at any age, that can actually kick in as well. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the nervous system, uh, the fight or flight mechanism is being developed in, in the embryo. And when the mother gets frightened, uh, certain of those blood chemicals and hormones and reactions transfer through the placenta and into the baby. So if the mother is getting stressed and uh, getting the different hormones being pumped through her blood, some of them may get into the baby's blood and cause the same thing. The baby doesn't know it's being stressed, but the heartbeat may go up. The breathing may go up, things like that. And when in, in the very delicate stages of, <clears throat> of the uh, embryo growing, that's when connections are being made. And if the connection is being made to adapt to a chronic stress process, that's how those connections potentially get made. Most of the time they still get made fairly correctly. You know, this is a chance for mutations to happen and uh, things not to connect. And, and that's when uh, a lot of uh, irregularities occur. Mm, maybe I shouldn't have gone on that roller coaster at five months pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> well, or, you know, sometimes it's good at that moment. It could have been also, you know, along with the hormone, there might have been the, uh, the sense of exhilaration and thrill that was transmitted also. <laughs> so sometimes it, uh, I'm just trying to help you here, Christina. <laughs> well, psychotherapy for you. <sighs> well, so what we're learning is that um, everything starts with perception. Uh, everything starts with perception. Somebody sees a threat or a danger or something is perceived as a stress and it goes to a certain portion of their brain. Before I, want, before I actually talk about uh, what happens there, I want to talk about the brain for a moment and say, you know, we always talk about the brain being divided in half into the right and left brain. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, where the left brain is the analytical concrete type, the right brain is creative and abstract, things like that. And many times we always say that in meditation, we want to go over to our right brain and where time doesn't exist and things like that. But you can also look at the brain instead of being split uh, down the middle for a left and a right. You can also imagine that there are splits in the brain that are parallel to the ground. If you put a plate uh, through the lower portion of the skull that's parallel to the ground, where the, imagine that the spinal cord uh, starts coming up and it comes up from the lower spine and it goes up through the abdomen and the thorax and up into the neck region. And at a certain point, the spinal cord starts becoming a brain. It's the brain stem. Mm. heard of that and the brain stem is if if the first plate comes just above the brain stem so the first uh layer or level of the brain from the bottom up is the brain stem and this is where all of our autonomic functions occur where the heartbeat is regulated and the uh, sensations happen and the breathing is regulated digestion is regulated this is the vegetative region mm. of the or the, you know, sometimes people might call it the reptilian brain or the lizard brain or something like that. This is the part where if people have bad head injuries, they could lose their higher level of functioning and everything else. But the lower brain stem, they're in a vegetative state, but their body can still uh, function on that level for long periods of time. And we've seen many very sad stories about things like this over time, but we've seen some happy ones where people have come back. So this lower level is the autonomic or vegetative state. The next level of the brain, uh, the next third of the brain, the middle of the brain, uh, is kind of the, the limbic system. It's the emotional uh, aspect of the brain. This is where the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland you've heard of, the pineal gland, which some people speak of as the first eye or third eye, uh, a lot of the glands occur here, and this is the seat of emotion and a lot of uh, fear, motivations, number of things, very complex. This is 
uh, this is a really complex area. And it seems to have some con- some control over the autonomic. Obviously, if you get excited, your heartbeat can go up. If you're really depressed, your heartbeat may go down. Your digestive changes may go down. Like you said before, a, a person could become blind if they're watching their children being burned in a fire uh, just from emotional processes. Uh, so that's the second portion of the brain. And then we as uh, humans have a higher level of the brain, the neocortex uh, region. And this is where analytic things happen. This is where we can analyze and intellectually discuss things and motivate. One of the fascinating things that seems to be happening right now as we progress is that it appears that each layer, the lower third, has its function. The next third, the limbic portion of the brain, has its function, but it has the ability to supersede in some cases, the lower autonomic portions. And we didn't really know that for a long time. And the top portion of the brain, the neocortex, uh, has the ability to supersede over the emotional. And this, this is possibly the key toward the healing that we're going to speak about in a little while. Just the fact that we know, we used to think, well, you can't really control. And I've said this in some of my Uh, talks before. You can't control your temperature, your pH. You can control breathing for a little while and then maybe heart rate and blood pressure. But we're starting to see that we may actually have more and more control over those things and also over our emotions and in our analysis of things, which has to do with part of the healing and and using the uh, anti-stress or relaxation technique. So now moving into, are you comfortable with what I just said? Completely comfortable. And it's it's so fascinating because for so many centuries, uh, you know, the monks all the way up in the Himalayas and Tibet, and they, they believe that you can be in full control. Right. And we're going to discuss that in a few moments also. <clears throat> but I just want to give a quick idea for people as to what happens in stress, because stress is not just, it's not a word. Well, it is a word, but it's really a system that happens within the body, uh, a program that goes on that we switch on in the body uh, that becomes actually serious effects of the body. So the the person, the organism perceives uh, a threat uh, of some kind or a trigger, and it doesn't have to be just a life threat. It could be a threat of a boss coming in to reprimand you. Uh, So it's not life threatening, but it is a trigger and you get stressed out or you're about to do your first uh, recital or you're in a spelling bee or something. Uh, You're going to do a performance, all of these things. So you perceive a threat. And in that middle portion of the brain, the limbic system, the hypothalamus reacts to that. And that sets up a whole series of events that happen. It starts sending signals. through the bloodstream and hormones and the nervous system through nerves to target organs where things are being produced. And we've all heard about adrenaline, epinephrine, norepinephrine. These are these are actual hormones that are produced. Uh, the epinephrine is produced in a portion of the adrenal gland, which lies on top of the kidney, uh, on each kidney. And and some people, I've been to some lectures where uh, the traditional Asian medicine uh, scholars are saying that it's actually the the adrenal glands above the kidney that they consider the kidney chi that they mm. out because that's where the energy is coming from, that adrenaline. So they were insightful enough potentially to see that it was the adrenal glands that produced epinephrine. And... <clears throat> The the brainstem uh, signals to the heart through a nervous system, which takes only a, less than a second or two seconds to react to get a heartbeat going. And then through the bloodstream, hormones are being sent down to the kidneys from the brain and the adrenal gland to produce the epinephrine and the norepinephrine or the adrenaline and also cortisol. And these... Uh, these hormones 
take a few more seconds than the nerves do, but the second process comes in and they increase the heart rate and they bring the metabolism and shut down the digestive system and the reproductive system and the growth system and the immune system. And they bring in all of the energy, which we talked about in metabolism a few moments ago, into the ability to be thinking very clearly and focused and energized and having the muscles to uh, work. It also has to shut down these other systems that I spoke about. And in shutting them down, they go under their own stressful process because they don't want to shut down. They want to do their work. So when they're shut down, they get stressed out and they have to deal with that. So this goes on every time you get stressed out. There's a whole system of things. If you get too much stress where there's too much adrenaline and too much cortisol, you may have a heart attack or you may have a stroke or you may, because of the cortisol, which is a hormone, it affects the blood sugar, causing it to rise. If you're insulin, which uh, comes from another endocrine gland, uh, doesn't bring the sugar down, you can have a problem of hyperglycemia where people can have seizures. So, so many things are happening. It's so complex that this concept of, oh, I'm stressed out, dude, uh, <laughs> is much deeper than that. And I believe that we need to address this uh, in a way that is not just about a word and a syndrome. I actually think that we need to deal with chronic stress we're talking about, not just the acute stress, the continuous process of having this system on all the time. Uh, I think we need to look at stress as a disease state because it's causing disease to all parts as all all parts as uh all the parts of our body all the systems and over time this will cause either instant death in a heart attack or a hemorrhaging stroke or it will cause a very slow painful death where someone who has uh, severe arthritis and gets crippled and is in pain all the time and can't function uh, and it can cause many things. It can cause heart diseases, it can cause gastrointestinal disease, obesity, uh, memory loss, uh, many of the mood disorders, uh, depression. I'm not saying it's the only cause, but it certainly adds to the process and speeds it up. Uh, so it's it's really important that we recognize this as something that we have to deal with. So how do... Mm. So first, in recognizing how we deal with it, we look at people like uh, Selye and then Andrew Weil and Herbert Benson. Herbert Benson uh, talked about uh, the, the concept of we have a fight or flight process in our body, but we also need something that's a relaxation process. And he felt and he and others feel that this relaxation process is due to or is developed through repetitive rhythmic programs that we do, which calm us down, which get rid of the cortisol and the adrenaline and lower the heart rate. And these rhythmic things you will recognize as listening to music, chanting, praying, breathing, meditating, dancing. All of these things are repetitive patterns of behavior like we spoke about in our last talk, that allow us to uh, calm down and recover and relax. And when we do these, we also get into sometimes meditative states, which are altered states, which make us feel good. And we continue to do this. And the belief here is that it's these uh, recovery practices, the rhythmic practices, were the origins of sp spirituality and religion, where people learn these recovery uh, methods, and then they pass them down uh, from child to child and generation and generation and ancestors, talking about these ways of relaxing and recovering 
and doing these patterns, beating drums, dancing around a, a fire, uh, breathing, stating mantras, praying, all of these things we just spoke about, patterns uh, to calm us down. So we learn that we have to recognize these triggers that bring this on. And that's the first step in all of this. We look at triggers. What are the kind of things that bring bring it on? Uh, the child that's been abused, when he hears high language or loud language, that may be a trigger. Uh, failure at times and knowing your boss is coming in uh, to talk to you may be a trigger. So many different triggers. Each person has their own individual triggers. And when you learn how to recognize the triggers, that's the first step. Another step is to uh, is to do what I talk about all the time in my six patterns uh, and categories. You need to eat healthy. You need to exercise. You need to sleep well. Uh, recognize patterns of behavior. Recognize spirituality and work in all of these programs to be better. Another thing to do is to have a positive attitude. Uh, try and be around family and friends. Uh, try and be around people that also have uh, positive attitudes and to be motivated. And then uh, there are many other things that can be done. Being happy, having a sense of humor, uh, telling jokes to people. And I know that when I was in the emergency department, I tried to have a joke every day so that when paramedics would come in or the police would come in or the other doctors would come in, talking to different nurses, I always had a joke. And so people, when they came to see me, you know, it was going to be in the most critical situation, but yet they came in because they were almost looking forward to what joke I had to tell them aside from the person with the heart attack. So they were in a better state of mind and less stressed and they were able to deal with things. And plus, uh, people got inspired to tell me jokes. So paramedics couldn't wait to come in or a uh, police officer couldn't wait to come in and say, oh, I heard this great joke. You got to hear this. I thought mm -hmm. it like so humor is a very important part. And the relaxation techniques that we talk about are an extremely important part of this process because these relaxation techniques are about, again, developing patterns to uh, recognize a stressor and then going through some kind of a rhythm, a breathing exercise. And you know that I talk about the Wallman metaphor, square breath, as a breathing exercise. We have that in uh, if you subscribe to uh, my website, you'll get that as a gift. And I use that all the time. But there are many different types of breathing patterns and exercises that people do to calm themselves down. I also recommend that people uh, consider learning a martial art, uh, be it uh, an internal, like a very slow and, and relaxed Tai Chi or Kung Fu or Karate or Aikido, because again, what this really is, if you break it down, it's a rhythmic dance pattern that you learn over and over and over. And it combines using the muscles and the skeletal system. It combines the breathing apparatus in the body. It combines focusing and energy and quiet. And it combines that all into a deeper consciousness. So you're taking something from the higher stress level where you perceive it in your neocortex. You're moving it down into the, in the middle third in the limbic region where all of the things start to happen with the pituitary and the hypothalamus and the nerves and the hormones that are going into the nervous system and the bloodstream affecting everything else. And you're bringing it down into the brainstem where the vagus nerve can uh, slow the heart down. And you're learning how to do this in a meditative state so that it becomes a subconscious thing. And as you move more of these calming things into your subconscious, then the triggers become less and less, or they become less powerful, or you recognize them more quickly. So you don't allow that adrenaline surge to get into the bloodstream. You may not be able to help the initial, uh, nerve part because that happens so quickly. Mm. Uh, but you may be able to do some things about the adrenaline or the cortisol 
And you may, if you can't stop the initial part, you might be able to slow the amount that goes into the bloodstream and therefore uh, cut the counter-regulatory stress adaptation syndrome uh, to something that doesn't last as long, especially if it's not something necessary. It's just a mental stressor rather than an actual physical threat. Also, you know, I do need to say that some people, uh, individuals, sometimes actually need uh, professional help and medication under too much stress. There were times when I would be in the emergency department where somebody was coming down or they stopped taking a psychotic medication or an antipsychotic medication or they were taking methamphetamine and ecstasy and injecting things into them. Uh, PCP, and they were so wild and out of touch, I couldn't reason with them. Most of the time, if somebody came in with a simple anxiety attack, I could speak with them and try and calm them through focus and breathing and talking to me. Many of that would work with people. But there were some people that were so clearly uh, out of it and under the influence of hormones and neurotransmitters and and old psychology and old uh, patterns of behavior, they couldn't be reached. And those people needed to be medicated so that they didn't harm themselves or they didn't attack a nurse or a police officer or uh, another physician or a lab tech that was trying to draw blood on them. Mm. So sometimes professional help is needed and professional medications are needed. But in many of our cases, uh, I believe that there's a lot that we can do just uh, emotionally and through all of these practices, as I said. Uh, any thoughts so far? Oh, any thoughts? <laughs> Am I supposed to use my brain? You know, which part of the brain? <laughs> You're putting me under stress. No. Good. Um, and and uh, I mean, I do believe too. It's I have a lot of people that that say, well, there's always so much happening in in you know my life, especially with the shows and raising a child, et cetera. Um, and they say, well, we don't meditate and we don't do exercises. We'd like to, mm. but our day is so full that we don't, no. you see. And it, it's uh, to be able to explain to people, to uh, bring an awareness that, you know, a practice does not have to be half an hour or even 15 minutes. A practice could be just learning, uh, for example, your metaphor square breath, which only takes a few minutes, if that, but learning it, practicing it, so that when it's necessary, <laughs> you your body knows it. It's almost like an automatic situation that comes up, because I know for myself, through years of, you know, uh, coordinating 3,000 students from overseas, things like that, and then suddenly the breast breaks down, what do you do, you know, who do you contact? If I didn't begin to be able to even step back for 30 seconds to just take that moment to bring the breath in and breathe it out and like shut everything out. Just 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah. I would not have been able to make very, very uh, important decisions under that sort of stress level. Um, so, so would you say, Glenn, you know, with a lot of people who, who, you know, I, I do believe as we get older and we have more responsibilities um, and we put, we take on more responsibilities in some cases or um, to those who don't have such a busy life. As you say, it's all relative, isn't it? It's like that, that young man, you know, saying, I'm stressed out, dude, <laughs> you know? <laughs> because he, he couldn't really remember the menu. You know, it's all relative. You know, there are some people who do stay at home. And there's a certain level of peace and quiet. And then suddenly something happens like just a minor bumper, like a, a, a little, you know, a scuff on the bumper or something like that. And they're completely stressed out just by something like that. Well, I would, you know, I would say, I would say this kind of in summarizing everything. I know that there's a lot of complexity that goes on. Uh, it takes, you know, a few years in medical school to understand really all of the systems. And we're still learning it. We, even to this day, we don't know everything that's happening, but I would, I would want to leave people with a few thoughts here. I would say that if you had 
if you had installed a smoke alarm system in your house and it went off, you would react to it. If you uh, were about to cross a railroad crossing and the uh, light started going on and the and the arm came down, the barricade came down, you would react to that. We develop alarm systems for the purpose of reacting to help us survive. I would like to say that this neuroregulatory stress adaptation syndrome, we should not think of it in any other way, but it's an alarm system. And it's giving us a warning that if we don't get out of this system and straighten things out, that every part of the body can be affected. And it's important to understand that. And that's why the second thing that I would like to leave people with, other than the fact that it's not just about I'm stressed out, dude, it's it's actually an alarm system that telling that's telling you something is wrong and it's going to get worse and it's going to keep getting worse until you deal with it. The second thing is that I really believe that we should look at uh, stress, chronic stress again, that I'm speaking about as a disease state because we see it in almost every other disease and it's got to be dealt with and it can be help to prevent the disease. That's the great part about it. If you recognize the alarm and the triggers and everything else, and you recognize that it has the potential to be a disease state where at some point you're not going to say I'm stressed out. You're going to say, oh, I had a heart attack and a triple bypass. Or at some point you're going, you're not going to say I'm stressed out. You're going to say I have colon cancer and I just had a, uh, my colon removed and now I'm, uh, using a bag for my uh, bowel movements, a colostomy bag. So it can affect every part of the body. And if you think about it as a disease state, then I think that it might help to bring it from in consciousness for people. It's not just a syndrome. It's not just a word that you deal with. Mm -hmm. The third thing I want to talk about is back to the meditation and not having time for the meditation. Uh, there's two things that I think meditation actually comes out with. And it's really, I can look at it again on a cellular level and even uh, moving to the more spiritual level. But meditation itself has effects on every part of the body that we're learning now, on the digestive system, on the immune system, on the uh, cardiovascular system, on the uh, nervous system. Stress has effects on that. And in meditation, meditation also by calming things down and getting out of that counter regulatory position of state and back into recovery and relaxation, uh, it helps us to recognize two things, I believe. One that we always speak about is being in the moment, being here and now. When we start thinking about what we did in the past, sometimes that's a stressor and it brings on anxiety uh, and depression. When we look at things in the future, we start getting uh, potentially stressed and anxious again, uh, and that starts the stress syndrome. So one of the things that meditation does is to keep us in the moment, uh, as we all know, and that moment is precious to us. But the other thing that I believe that it does and it goes back to the patterns and rhythms of, you know, the breathing or the dance or uh, the drumming and the music, et cetera, is it actually puts us into a zone. Uh, you hear that this this athlete is in the zone or this uh, musician is uh, in the zone. It takes us into a flow where. It's not about the being in the moment anymore, but it's how we flow to the next moment, how we cruise into the moment after that. If that flow is smooth and nurtured and quiet and regulated, then that makes us happy. That keeps us unstressed 
and that prevents many parts of the disease state and it keeps us in uh, homeostasis or balance. Mm -hmm. So the importance of the concept when you said, I don't have time for the meditation, uh, if you have time to eat and you have time to breathe, you have a few minutes to meditate because what you're doing is you're recognizing an alarm, you're recognizing a potential disease state, and you're trying to improve them by being in the moment and flowing into the next moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd like to add to that, too, that, that I, I believe that some people feel, or when they hear the word meditation or they hear the word, um, uh, you know, taking the moment to breathe, that they think it's, it's literally having to set that aside and sit down and, you know, be in an om position, <laughs> you know, with your legs crossed. You know, and I, and I say, you know, really, some people find their meditation through something that they're doing. Like during the gardening or during baking or during, you know, there, there are certain things that people do. And I, I mean, I know for me, it used to be when I, while I was washing my floor. <laughs> that was my most meditative state of being was washing my floor. It was, you know, it's a, it was a very, very interesting time where, where it, I was alone. I had to work on my breath because I was on all fours and I was using emotion, almost like, you know, people would breathe during Tai Chi. It was a fluid motion that I would continue to use. And I found my meditation during then as well. So it's, um, you know, it, it's not, sometimes we perceive things as, as uh, um, that uh, the society or media has brought forward as opposed to what it really is perceptions that's mm -hmm. true mm -hmm. and actually a, a part of the meditation that does happen i i believe that at the beginning as you're learning just like anything else it's a be, it's a behavior and it's a it's a skill to a degree and you have to practice it so by just sitting for a while once you learn it then you can certainly bring it into mindfulness of everything else you're doing and be able to do it standing walking active in certain ways that will trigger uh messages to your brain for calming and and allowing and flowing mm. they're very important for us i think it's if we start looking at stress as a disease state then <clears throat> maybe it will bring out the importance of that meditation you know the other part of meditation or a, another thing and you talk about perceptions we're always trying to find out who we are in our meditations uh it's also just as important to find out who we are not. And <laughs> That's a very good point. <laughs> times the who we are not uh, is the reasons that we get stressed out. Mm, that's a wonderful point. Wonderful point. And that's uh, very, very true, especially in the societies that we live in. <laughs> we try to be. We try to be people that we are not. And that is a wonderful point. John Kabat-Zinn talks about that a lot in his mindfulness and meditations, and, and many you know, do, as you were talking about the Tibetan monks and all the monks around the world and the uh, people that go into higher consciousness, all of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we should, we should uh, tell people uh, some uh, what our future is for a moment. We have something planned as a treat for everyone with... Uh, each, each of our episodes, uh, we always asked the person we were interviewing for a health tip. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're putting together the best of 2012. <laughs> all, the all the health tips for 2012. <laughs> health tips of 2012. And you know, I have to say, in going through them all, it was amazing some of the things that people... That's wonderful spoke about it was beautiful mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and uh, so often the simplest ones are were magnificent because it was you understood it immediately right <laughs> because you also got the chance to know about them a little bit throughout the beginning of the conversation and what they did and how they reacted and then uh, to come up with what they perceive as the health tip for other people it's, it's really a nice compilation mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. offering 
to people to listen to? How how will they listen to it? Um, you know, I, I I think we should be um, able to put that up for, did we say New Year's? I think we did say New Year's. Is that what we said? Maybe sometime New between Year's Day. New Year's. Sometime in that area. Yeah, it'd be really nice to to launch uh, twenty thirteen with that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we'll we'll uh, see with the schedule. We'll try to piece all that together, and um, you know because it's, it's a lot of clips. <laughs> yeah, a lot of clips. Well, we are on our thirty ninth episode with this, so there's thirty nine about thirty nine clips that we have to put together. Well, so I, we'll do our best. Might be I part did. one and part two. <laughs> Well, I didn't give health tips each time I spoke, so there was maybe only about 37. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, because your whole talk is a tip. <laughs> well, I want to say that I am grateful to everyone for our uh, for participating in, in our show with us. Uh, I'm thankful to all the people that have been on our show and uh, given their wisdom and expertise, and I thank all of my teachers for their wisdom and expertise and and I thank my healers to keep me on my journey. And thank you, Christina, uh, as we come into this uh, holiday season of peace and things like that and love. Mm. And stress. No stress. <laughs> We're doing the medical breath and no stress. No stress, no stress. But I'm looking forward to... Uh, many more of these uh, magical medical tours as we uh, explore various quadrants of the healthcare galaxy looking for optimal health. And in, in that moment, I also would like to wish everyone in this holiday season, I wish you all blessings of optimal health. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Glenn Woolman, our medical guide. And of course, we here at YHTV would like to thank each and every one of you for joining us and supporting us on this new platform of education and information. And it's still considered very new, by the way. Um, We're grateful for your continuous support. And, you know, please, please let us know if how we can support you better. If there's a topic that you would like us to focus on, you know, please contact us. Don't be shy. Just uh, let us know. Um, everything's kept in confidence and we will definitely try to find the experts in those areas to come and speak with us. We are very excited to announce that you can access the Magical Medical Tour through iTunes. Uh, When you are in iTunes, just look for YHTV or Magical Medical Tour and you will find the whole series already in, um, in that area that you can download to your wonderful iPod or whatever device that you uh, have and listen to it at any time. And uh, the Trinity of Life should be launching soon on iTunes as well and Anatara's Flowing into Awareness. And again, we invite you every Tuesday at 10.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 1.30 Eastern Time for the Magical Medical Tour and Wednesdays for Trinity of Life at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Followed every other week with our new show, Flowing into Awareness with Anatara. Let me remind you that you can find and contact Dr. Glenn Woolman at myyogahub.com forward slash G Woolman and on Twitter at Glenn Woolman and of course through his own site, glennwoolman.com. And be sure when you're there to learn about his metaphor square breath. And that will definitely help you ride through any stressful situation and uh, into our wonderful 2013 coming up in a few weeks. Until we meet again, namaste. Ah, it's a good show. Think so? Yeah, yeah. It's it's like, uh, well, if uh, anyone wants to know about stress and where it comes from and how it starts and how it begins, here it is. This is yeah. like, I felt like this is stress 101. Yeah, that's what it, that's, yeah. <laughs> I, tried to, I tried to make it that. I tried to give a big picture. I know it's, I mean, I could talk about just acetylcholine for five hours. Which would what be is a, acetylcholine, or, please? <laughs> 
Acetylcholine is the uh, neurotransmitter chemical that goes in the synapse that connects one transmission to it to the next nerve. Oh my gosh! Uh, there's it's so all of this is so complex, and I tried to I when I started thinking about it, you know, I my first thought is always from the medical point of view, as if I were speaking medically and talking about pathways. Uh, and chemical breakdowns, then starting to talk about fat metabolism and protein, meta- uh, so all of it. And I just, I tried to see if I could figure it out as least complexly as possible to give sort of a bigger picture of the overview of everything and to bring out the fact that it isn't just mm-hmm. a word, that we need to deal with it. I mean, I, I really... I'm seeing now that people that have things, no matter what body system it's in, there's some kind of a stress-related process to most of it, mm. and it ex- and the and the stress. Something I didn't say is, you know, I I mean, I I was going to get into the different types, parts of the nervous system where there's <laughs> the sympathetic system, which is essentially like a gas pedal. You know, when the sympathetic nervous system gets uh, turned on, it's like putting the pushing the gas pedal down. And then there's the alternative, the parasympathetic, which is the brake. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And those man, I used all, to know all this because because right. that's in Psych 101. It's in everything 101. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's in everything 101. 